Um, an interesting um, question came up at the end of my um, talk, whenever that was Friday, by a, um, um, a woman who's a neuroscientist or biochemist at UCSF who was who was here. I don't don't think she's here tonight. Um, who, from the uh, point of view of looking at the material that I was presenting as a as a scientist, namely one not necessarily conversant with all this cultural history over 20,000 years, felt that the archetypal structures of the enduring and uh, great mother and the slow and sluggish cell and the spunky dynamical spirochete and the vanishing male were sort of oppressive archetypes that had been used to typecast women into archetypal positions and then lock them in to thought forms that then can be politically crystallized and reinforced. And so what I think uh, it's interesting to stop for a moment when one is coming across ethnological material or material cross-cultural or, or iconographic material over, as I was giving you over, you know, thousands and thousands of years, all the way back from 25,000 BC, is to uh, realize that the way this was constructed in other cultures isn't necessarily what we would consider politically correct or agree with. And, and in that point of view, our immediate response to defend our turf isn't as valuable as first trying to, in Coleridge's sense, surrender in an act of, uh, you know, uh, surrender disbelief in an act of poetic faith. What I'm basically uh, trying to show you by going from the biological material that I gave you for the first presentation, on which there are certain kinds of archetypal structures that occur in the architectures of cellular uh, symbiosis, and how these uh, begin to get played out in many different contexts and recur and recur and recur is a way of trying to understand recurring structures. Archetype, there are many different ways that one can understand the word. Weberian and, and Jungian are two different ways. In the material of um, the first video, music video I showed you, there's a kind of architecture of consciousness and an architecture of time that I was trying to pre present you with the sort of before there was even a brain, the preconditions of consciousness, taking it all the way down to Buddha's first skanda. In the follow-up material of the iconography of the Paleolithic to the Neolithic, it's showing the architecture of consciousness as the body is the most immediate metaphor. So one has to, I think, in an act of imaginative and poetic recovery, understand that uh, for these people, uh, the, the mystery of menstruation is uh, a thing of fascination because it is the wound that heals. It bleeds, it looks like a sort of sword wound or a stab wound, uh, and then it renews itself, and it renews itself in harmony with the, the cyclicity of the moon. So the correspondences of as above, so below, and the witness of the body, which is a phrase of whiteheads that I've always loved, uh, begins to present a kind of biologic that is using the body as the primordial metaphor, as the most immediate and accessible metaphor for time. Now, the, the, the male metaphor, the, the erection, is again uh, an obviously immediate and available metaphor, but one that's fascinating from observation because the erection occurs in the act of love, but it also occurs in shamanic trance states and the awakening of Kundalini and the ev elevation of Kundalini, so it's a kind of shamanic ecstatic trance state uh, phenomenon, and it occurs in dreams. And so each of those cases, there is a, a, a pointedness, uh, to be a kind of pun, a pointedness to the intensity of time uh, that uh, is an altered state and is uh, valuable to the degree of its ecstatic intensity and finitude. But the most um, uh, obvious thing about the erection is that it is not uh, a permanent condition of the, of the penis. It comes and it goes, and the, whereas the great mother and the wound that heals itself is much more a kind of cyclical phenomenon. So these begin to get constructed in, I would say, and this is basically, uh, you know, the, uh, the narrative of my own cultural philosophy, these begin to get constructed as biological metaphors and as a kind of cultural matrix or cultural metaphysics that I think is part of the world's first universal religion, this great mother religion. When you come at it much later, uh, in the, uh, at the time of, say, uh, the pre-Socratics and the Ionian physiologist, Heidegger, in his introduction to metaphysics, tries to do a kind of etymological understanding of the word phusis, 
and in all of his analysis of the word thusis meaning uh, arising, it never once occurs to him, uh, so abstract as his mind, that the arousal and the arising and the standing forth from being by a being, the thusis that breaks up of the, the general matrix of universal order and has its distinct physicality is actually part of this phallic cosmology from prehistory. And thusis is actually a kind of uh, phallic phenomenology. In much the same way, when Michel Serre is writing his book on Les Origines de la Géométrie, he never talks about the fact that Anaximander and his work on the unlimited is really just rewriting uh, the concept of the great mother and calling it the unlimited. And the thing which arises as the limited thing and breaks away from the unlimited is the phallic function that then has to pay back to the unlimited for it, the, its injustice of existence according to necessity and the arrangements of time. So Anaximander is reconceptualizing and rewriting in, a, in an abstract form this cultural matrix of the relationship of these modalities of the, of the great mother and, and the phallic uh, arising of, of Fusis. But it's peculiar that because uh, we tend to write our cultural histories with, uh, starting with Anaximander and the pre-Socratics, tend not to be sensitive in the ways that I think we should, as Maria Gambutis has made us sensitive, that old Europe and new Europe are, are connected and that there isn't that great divide. And that some of these ideas and that what philosophy is doing is reco reconceptualizing what had been mythopoeic uh, insights and the cultural metaphysic that goes all the way back to the, um, uh, to the religion of the Great Mother. So that it's always seemed to me kind of astonishing that neither Heidegger nor Michel Serre, great you know, uh, heavies that they are in the world of philosophy, seem to be aware of this other quality. So the, what, uh, what's going on, I think, with this modality of time is not uh, sexism, but the prehistory of the male and female relationship <coughs> that goes through many permutations over the millennia. And so when patriarchy comes up and does institutionalize its formation, uh, it retranslates a lot of these things in ways that begin to take on a, a political tonality that uh, the contemporary world is trying to break loose of <coughs> with all its militarism and hierarchy and the rest of it. Uh, now, also what I was saying last time was I was trying to put forth the notion that there is this evolution uh, of culture that has to be seen embedded in cultural ecologies and that each of these cultural ecologies uh, brings forth a new mentality and that there are texts that are, should be seen as both literary and mathematical that articulate the cultural ecology and then develop it to its dominant expression and then finally raise it to its climactic expression where beyond which you, you can't go and you, the only place to go is into a new mentality. Does anyone here have absolute pitch and can hum the first three notes of Bach's Art of the Fugue? The three distinct notes. Dum, bum, bum, something like that. Now, you can, you can see that as a kind of triadic function of structure, as a, as a musical metaphor for formative, dominant, climactic. And so in the uh, story that I want to tell of the, as the title of this lecture series is The Transformations of Western Civilization, I don't want to tell the story as intellectual history. I don't want to tell the story as, this is all the way I was raised, of course. Uh, I don't want to tell the story as the history of ideas, because taking an idea out of its vivid living culture and its embeddedness in cultural ecology, I think is part of the problem we've gotten into in our ecological crisis of dissociating uh, ideas uh, from uh, ecological uh, processes in life in general. So I want to try to embed the culture back into the cultural ecology and to show various other kind of processes uh, taking place that affect the other narratives as we know them, like the origins of, of mathematics or the origins of literature. So I see this movement uh, not starting with the Greeks, but starting with the riverine cultures of Egypt and Mesopotamia. And I go along with Martin Bernal's Black Athena that the influences of Egypt on Greece are enormous, that uh, the uh, Englishmen who wrote a lot of the first takes on the Greeks, like Cornford and the others, Benjamin Jowett, uh, they didn't care for the Phoenicians so much because they were Semites with hook noses and there was this whole kind of gentlemanly anti-Semitism. So they didn't, and they were kind of tacky people involved in human sacrifice and they did have a lot of human sacrifice in Carthage. 
so there was a sense that these were the barbarous people who were sacrificing to the children to Moloch. But the, um, the establishment of the alphabet, the creation of the cultural ecology of the Mediterranean, the projection out from the Near Eastern cultures into the successive Mediterranean culture, you can't tell the narrative without coming to terms with the Phoenicians. So I want to go back and uh, consider the riverine cultures and even look in at the Gilgamesh epic as part of one of the, the, the roots of Western literature and not, not start it with, with Homer. In, uh, in the riverine culture, as I said last time, there is the formative work, which is the erotic cycle of, of the love story of Anan and Demuzi, and uh, how the maze of the arts of civilization were loaded on the boat and carried off from one city to another, taken from the father by the daughter god and given to her low human uh, shepherd lover. What's interesting about this work is the manner in which this early literature is incredibly um, concerned with lists, with accumulation, with storage, the storehouse, the scrotum is often described as, a, as the storehouse, and how in this uh, fascination with the mystery of the arithmetic mentality, it's a mentality that in which enumeration, uh, answering the question, how does the one become two, uh, and sexuality are twin mysteries. If um, you recall the statue that I passed around with you last time, if you uh, look at the statue and turn it back and forth, it's basically a kind of icon that's a koan that's answering the question, how does the one become two? How does the universal mother, the matrix, generate the many? How does number come from oneness? So the great mother, in a sense, is a kind of mathematical matrix of enumeration. And so in this arithmetic mentality, sexuality is seen as sacred and is a mystery, and it is intensely erotic. I mean, you'd be surprised if you read with a modern you know, Christian puritanical sensibility, and you read this, this erotic poetry in, in, in uh, Diane Volkstein's book of just how contemporary uh, and, uh, it seems to us. I mean, it's got Henry Miller has nothing on the origins of, West, uh, of literature, and indeed the origins of literature are erotic and sexual. So literature uh, has this, is a performance of this mystery of the relationship of language and sexuality that I talked about in the time following Marty's Take the Light. So the, the notion of generation, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, whether you have it in Hesiod or you have it in uh, the Bible or you have it in uh, the Inanna cycle, is one in which the, the uh, arithmetic mentality is an immanental, not a transcendental mentality. And it's one in which the body is the basic kind of uh, architecture of consciousness and the carrier of the mysterium tremendum. And the body is seen to... Uh, hold in its story the story of time, of the eternal return of the, of the vulva as the wound that heals, and the rise and fall of the dying male. And so as, as time progresses, the male that has no name begins to be a named character. And you can see this if, if you compare ancient things like Demuzi doesn't, for example, have as much personality as Anana. Anana is this goddess. She's fascinating. She's writing odes to her vulva. She's, uh, she's stealing the arts of civilization and getting her, her father god drunk. She's enterprising uh, and full of activity. Uh, so she's not just a passive, uh, great, uh, slothful figure. She's the, the slim maiden rather than the uh, slow and obese great mother. Um, but she is uh, she's definitely uh, a person uh, with character. Demuzi is just this guy who dies. And think of the I Isis and Osiris myth. What is I? Uh, Osiris, but this kind of wimp that dies and loses his palace and can't, you know, can't find it because the fish got it, which probably is a, is a deferral in, in sort of David Ulansi's uh, research on the procession of the equinox. The fact that De uh, Osiris becomes lord of the dead but can't become like Christ, lord of the physical realm, and can't uh, recover his palace is probably a sign that the fish swallowed it, which means that the solution of that problem is in the Piscean Age. Because this, and Martin Bernal has a whole analysis that the, the procession of the equinox is knowledge that actually goes back much farther than we realize. And uh, so the whole notion that uh, Isis can reconstitute Osiris but cannot find his phallus because the phallus was swallowed up by the fish is a esoteric performance of the mystery of the 2,000 year cycle that what Osiris is about is dealing with the bardo and the realm of death. And the only uh, solution that is available in that 2,000-year cycle of 2000 BC is to become the lord of the astral plane, the lord of the dead. He can't, as the avatar for the next 
2,000 year cycle, which is going to be Jesus and Mary and not uh, I, 